Greetings, men. What's the big discussion about? Hi, Tech. Hank was just about to explain some of the body electrical circuits to me. That's right, Tech. I'd like to kind of review some of the circuits that haven't changed and talk about some of the new circuits for 1965. Good idea, Hank. Lead on. Let's take turn signals first. Although the circuit looks complicated, it's really simple if you take it in sections. First of all, notice that there are two supply leads to the turn signal switch. One from the flasher unit and one from the stoplight switch. The stoplight switch is fed from the fuse block. The flasher unit is connected to the ignition switch accessory terminal. With the turn signal switch in neutral, the stoplight circuit goes through the turn switch and to both rear lights. Now let's see what happens when we signal for a left turn. The movable contacts connect the flasher unit lead to the left stoplight filament, the left front turn signal filament, and the left indicator lamp. The stoplight circuit then feeds only the lamp on the right side of the car. For instance, in our example, the left turn signal is flashing, so the right lamp is available for a stop signal. I noticed that the turn signal bulbs on each side are wired in parallel. How do you tell if one is burned out? By the flasher operation, Bob. You see, the flasher is set to open the circuit under a specific load, like a circuit breaker. If part of that load is removed, then the flasher operation stops. There's one exception to this. If an indicator lamp burns out, you'll still have flashing turn signals. It's easy to spot this condition, because you'll still be able to hear the flasher clicking. Here's another diagnosis tip, Bob. Losing the ground at one of the front turn signal lamps will stop the flasher action. Instead, both parking lamp filaments will glow dimly. Here's the reason. The parking lamp feed connects the two filaments, so the turn signal current follows right through to the ground on the other side. Well, that should be easy to check out. I'll just turn on the parking lights, and if one of them doesn't light, but it comes on dim when the turn signal is turned on for that side, then I'll know it's a bad ground. Nice going, Bob. Uh, I think Hank has a couple more tips for you. I sure do, Tech. If you suspect a flasher unit, try it in both turn positions. If it works in one direction but not in the other, the flasher's okay. The trouble is either a bad bulb, a bad ground, or a loose connection. When the turn signals don't work on either side, see if the heater and radio are operative. They also get their power from the accessory lead of the ignition switch. If they're okay, install a new flasher unit. I know that some of the cars have only one indicator light. How is the single bulb wired into both left and right turn circuits? Well, Bob, the basic turn signal circuit is the same as the systems with two indicators. The case of the single indicator bulb is not grounded but is connected to one of the front turn signal leads. The ground is obtained through the turn signal filament on the opposite side from the intended turn. So on a left turn, it grounds through the right-hand bulb. But why doesn't that bulb light too? That's a fair question, Bob. The indicator bulb causes a high voltage drop. That doesn't leave enough voltage to heat up the right turn signal bulb. And that's a fair answer, Tech. Now here's another question. I understand we have some brand new power window circuits. That we do, Bob. In fact, the whole system is new on Furies, Polaris, Custom 880s, Monaco's, and the entire Chrysler line. Right, Hank? Right, Tech. For one thing, the window lift motor is a permanent magnet type. All the motors are grounded at a common point, which greatly simplifies diagnosis of possible wiring difficulties. All circuits are grounded through a single terminal in the master switch at the left front door. Each door switch has an individual hot lead. The overall circuit is protected by a circuit breaker located inside the left cowl panel. To understand how the system works, let's look first at the operation of the left front window and the master switch. Then we'll tie in the circuits to the other windows. Notice that when the switch is in the neutral position, both of the movable contacts are closed to ground. These movable contacts become motor feed and motor ground when the switch is operated. Moving the switch in the down direction pushes one of the movable contacts against the battery contact in the base of the switch, completing the down circuit to the motor. Since this is a permanent magnet motor, I guess you just reverse the direction of current flow to run the window back up. 
I'd guess Bob's been studying some uh, basic electricity, wouldn't you, Hank? I sure would, Tech. And reversing the current flow is as simple as pushing the switch in the other direction. This allows the movable down contact to return to ground and pushes the up contact against the hot lead. Control of the other three window lift motors from the driver's seat is just as simple. Current flow through the applicable master switch is exactly the same as for the left front window lift. The individual lift switch must be in the neutral position to allow control from the master switch. Current flows both to and from the motor through the upper contacts of the switch. The direction of the flow, which determines the rotational direction of the motor, depends on the position of the master switch. Control of the window from the individual lift switch involves a slightly different circuit. Both terminals in the base of the switch are hot and feed one of the movable terminals when the switch is operated. Let's see now. You said the only ground in the system is at the master switch. So the current must flow through the motor, back through the individual switch, and to ground through the movable contact in the master switch. Exactly right, Robert. Of course, the direction of the current flow through the motor determines which ground terminal is used. The switches are held in the panel by spring clips. Checking the window lift circuits is a pretty simple matter. Most of the tests can be made without removing the trim panel. If none of the windows will operate from either the master switch or the individual switches, check the single ground connection at the master switch and the battery lead to the circuit breaker. To check the ground, pull the switch and connector from the door trim panel. Connect a jumper wire between a good ground and one of the leads to an individual switch and try that switch in both directions. If the window operates, you'll know the trouble is in the master switch. That's because the only ground in the circuit is at the master switch, not at the motor as on previous systems. Now, here's another tip. If a window operates from the master switch, but not from the individual switch, use a test light to check continuity between the circuit breaker and the individual switch. I think I can anticipate the next one, Hank. It probably won't happen very often, but a window that operates from the individual switch and not from the master just has to be caused by a bad master switch if all the other windows work normally. Here's the way I figure it. The single hot lead to the master switch feeds the master switch circuits to all four windows. It's not likely that one would be dead unless all four of them were. The one common connection between the master switch and all the other switches is the ground. So if the ground is bad, the window lifts won't work from any switch. The only answer is that the hot circuit inside the master switch has gone haywire. And that means a new master switch. Does that make sense, Hank? It makes a lot of sense, Bob. But not all the problems are electrical. Sometimes a mechanical hang-up causes inactive windows. Bent or binding linkage and pinched channels are the most common mechanical causes of window problems. It's easy to identify mechanical problems since there will always be at least a slight movement of the glass. If you have to take the motor off the linkage, be sure to clamp the assembly in a vise so the linkage is locked in place. If you don't, the assist spring will flip the linkage and it could cost you some skin. And if uh, someone doesn't flip the record, it could cost us a new needle. Before we move away from the doors, let's look at the electric door locks. The Imperial system is the same as last year. However, a new system is used on other models. Let's cover it first. Essentially, the new system contains a double-acting solenoid in each door and two switches in each front door. Back door locks are operated mechanically with the back door push buttons, but they can also be locked and unlocked remotely from either front door. Pushing down on either of the front door lock buttons momentarily closes a circuit between the circuit breaker, located inside the left cowl panel, and the door locking relay inside the right cowl panel. The energized locking relay completes the circuits to the locking windings in all four of the solenoids. Each solenoid is grounded independently to the door inner panel. To unlock all four doors, simply pull up on either front door button. This energizes the unlocking relay, which completes the circuits to all four solenoid unlocking windings. 
Well, since there are switches only at the front doors, it looks like the back doors can be locked or unlocked separately. Yep. The rear door solenoids just hook out of the regular linkage. That's why the rear lock buttons move when you lock or unlock them electrically from the front. Right, Tech. There's another lock switch actuated by the key cylinder linkage. When either front door is locked with the key, all doors lock automatically. The circuit is the same as when the lock button is pushed down. When either front door is unlocked from the outside, the lock cylinder linkage moves the switch arm upward without closing any electrical circuits. That's why all the rest of the doors remain locked. Well, how about service procedures? There doesn't seem to be much that can go wrong. You're right, Bob. There's only one simple adjustment at each door to provide the correct amount of solenoid travel. If you can hear the solenoid working, but the door doesn't lock, remove the trim panel and loosen the solenoid mounting screws. The mounting holes are elongated to allow correct positioning. The imperial locks are the same as last year's. Here's the main difference between the imperial and the new system. The imperial front push buttons will lock all four doors, but pulling the button up unlocks only that one door. A separate switch on each front armrest locks and unlocks all four doors. You'll find more on electric door locks in the reference book for this session. Now, Hank, you'd better cover the windshield wipers on the 65 models. Coming right up, Tech. We have a new single-speed wiper motor that's standard on Furies, Polaras, Custom 880s, Monaco's, and some Chrysler's. It's a permanent magnet-type motor. The circuit is very simple and easy to understand. The wiper switch has a built-in circuit breaker between the battery terminal and the combination terminal marked P1 and backup. This is also the feed terminal for backup lights, so it's always hot when the ignition is on. Turning the switch on connects the A terminal to the battery feed through the circuit breaker and P1 terminal. The current flow is through the armature to ground. When the switch is turned off again, the current goes from the P1 terminal to the park switch in the motor, back to the P2 terminal at the switch, and then to the armature from the A terminal. As the blades reach the park position at the end of the wiping pattern, the park switch opens the circuit from the P1 terminal and switches to ground. But the armature already has one ground. Why do we need a second ground? So the blades will always park in the correct position. You see, the motor has a tendency to coast after the current is shut off. Since the armature windings are cutting through the magnetic field of the permanent magnet, the coasting motor then becomes a generator. Both output leads are grounded so the generator is subjected to maximum load, which means maximum drag on the armature. You might run into a little bit of confusion on the single-speed wiper switch, Bob. We're still using a wound field-type single-speed motor on some models, but we use the same switch. However, we don't use the P2 switch terminal with the wound field motor. Well, that's plain enough, Hank. How about service procedures? Well, the motor is mounted in the engine compartment in these cars, which means it is real easy to get to. The park switch timing adjustment is the only service required on the motor. To adjust the park timing on either single speed motor, loosen the five retaining screws on the gearbox and turn the metal cover plate. Turn the plate to the left if timing is late or to the right if timing is early. On variable speed motors, the adjustments are made in the opposite directions. We have two different suppliers of these variable speed motors, Bob. There's a little difference in the adjusting procedure. One motor has a nylon plate with a hex in the middle to take a wrench. On the other, you loosen the five screws and turn the metal cover plate. Right, Tech. And here's an easy way to tell if the parking timing is off. If the blade parks and then goes up slightly, the timing is late. If the blade moves down before moving up, when the wipers are first turned on, the timing is too early. That's a good one to remember. It looks like the wiper linkage is easy to get at in these cars. It is, Bob. Just remove the lower windshield molding and the vent grill panel, and the whole works is right there. Here's another tip. When you get all the retaining screws out of the grill panel, close the hood before you try to lift the panel out. You'll have to remove the pivot bezels, too. 
And we have a new special tool for removing the wiper arms. And most important of all, disconnect the battery, or at least remove the ignition key, before you work on the wiper linkage. If you don't, and you happen to move the crank arm enough to close the park switch, the motor will run through the park cycle, and maybe take your fingers with it. I'll be sure to remember that one, Tech. What about wiper blade adjustments? Well, the variable speed wipers park against the windshield molding. To check the parking, lift the tip of the arm toward the top of the windshield with a force of about three pounds. The tip of the blade should not move more than three inches from the molding. Both types of single speed wipers park at the lowest point of the wiping pattern. The tip of the blade should not touch the molding when you push down on the end of the arm with about three pounds force. Those wiper arms look exactly alike. Are they interchangeable? No, they're not, Bob. If you look real close, you'll see a slightly larger angle on the left arm. And if you look even closer, you'll find that they're stamped L and R on the underside near the blade end. Here's one that's been bothering me, Hank. I know that variable speed wipers park by reversing the motor, but how do they travel beyond the wiping pattern? There's a spring and cam assembly between the wiper motor arm and the pivot connecting link. Here's what it does. While the wipers are running, the spring release inner tab releases the spring from the pin, allowing the pin to turn freely. When the motor rotation is reversed, the spring release stop tab moves away from the notch in the pivot linkage. The spring tightens on the pin, causing the cam, spring, and spring release to rotate 180 degrees. The cam rotation lengthens the reach of the pivot connecting link by about one quarter inch. It's important that the parking switch timing be adjusted to stop the motor when the linkage is longest. Right, Tech, and lubrication is important too. If the drive pin wears to the point where the spring won't grip it, the wipers just won't park in the right position. The spring and pin should be greased any time the unit's disassembled. The only approved lubricant is Chrysler Parts lead plate. Open the spring with snap ring pliers so all the coils are separated. Then dip the spring in a can of lead plate and replace it over the pin. This way, you'll be sure that every part of the spring and pin will be lubricated. How do I check whether the pin is causing parking problems? Very simple, Bob. Peel back the protective boot and see if you can turn the trip release ring. If it moves at least one thirty-second of an inch, the over-travel mechanism is okay. There's one more thing you ought to know about, Bob. We have additional protection in the wiring this year. There's a new fusible safety link between the starter relay and the ammeter. Excuse me for interrupting, Hank. That story about the fusible link is real important, as well as interesting. But we're running out of time. So, all you technicians had better check the reference book for the complete story on this. And more details about the other circuits we've been talking about.